Hello and welcome to the Jane Austen Garden Trail. New for 2019, our unique walking route around the Chawton grounds allows visitors to follow in Jane's footsteps. Each sign is located at an iconic spot around the gardens with a quotation from Austen's writings. The signs are erected on wooden plinths made from trees sourced from the Chawton estate. These were prepared and placed around the grounds by Paul and Jeremy Knight, descendants of Edward Austen Knight. Our first plinth is fittingly what visitors first see when they arrive at Chawton House, that is, the approach to the house. It was a sweet view, sweet to the eye and the mind, English verdure, English culture, English comfort, seen under a bright, sun bright, without being oppressive. This quotation is taken from Jane Austen's novel Emma and is a description of the Domwell Abbey estate, family seat of the Knightleys. Some say Domwell is modelled on Chawton. Notice the emphasis on the ideal of Englishness. Our second plinth is in the library terrace behind the house. I can listen no longer in silence. I must speak to you by such means as are within my reach. You pierce my soul. I am half agony, half hope. Tell me not that I am too late, that such precious feelings are gone forever. These lines are from the proposal scene in Persuasion in the penultimate chapter. It denotes a reunion and revelation between Anne Elliot and Captain Wentworth. Romantic words for a romantic spot. As we leave the library terrace, we look back with views to the church. Give us grace, almighty Father, so to pray as to deserve to be heard, to address thee with our hearts as with our lips. Thou art everywhere present. A prayer by Jane Austen. An apt choice of the location, lest we forget Jane Austen was very religious herself, being the daughter of a clergyman. Next, we move up to the serpentine path. We have taken such a very serpentine course, and the wood itself must be half a mile long in a straight line, for we have never seen the end of it yet, since we left the first great path. Jane Austen, Mansfield Park. These words are spoken by Mary Crawford whilst walking arm in arm with Fanny and Edmund. The literature students amongst you might linger over the potential serpentine metaphor. We now reach the upper terrace and stop to take in the magnificent view. To sit in the shade on a fine day and look upon verdure is the most perfect refreshment. Another Mansfield Park quote. Here, Fanny Price, who has an acute appreciation of nature and the picturesque, ruminates on life's simple pleasures. Next, we slip into the fernery. A mind lively and at ease, Jane Austen, Emma. Though not specifically about landscape or gardens, this plaque was in memory of a friend and gives the secluded spot a sense of profundity and peace. As we approach the walled garden, we turn first to the rose garden. If she gathered flowers at all, it was chiefly for the pleasure of mischief. Jane Austen, Northanger Abbey. A favourite quote of mine, as it appeals to my inner tomboy. 
Jane Austen describes her unconventional heroine in Northanger Abbey and begins the quotation with, Indeed, she had no taste for a garden. Crossing over the path, we see a mulberry tree very much alive, but I will not say that your mulberry trees are dead, but I am afraid they are not alive. Jane Austen wrote this to her sister Cassandra in a letter, dated 31st of May, 1811. Fortunately, our mulberry trees have fared better. We enter the walled garden and stroll up to the Pride and Prejudice Rose Walk. Though the love of a hyacinth may be rather domestic, who can tell the sentiment once raised, but you may in time come to love a rose? Jane Austen, Northanger Abbey. After the storm the night before, Catherine is embarrassed about her behaviour and coming down to breakfast spots the hyacinth. These lines are spoken by Henry Tilney as is the following in the same chapter. But now you love a hyacinth so much the better. You have gained a new source of enjoyment, and it is well to have as many holds upon happiness as possible. We take a stroll into the orchard, where good apple pies are a considerable part of our domestic happiness. Jane Austen in a letter. This is a reference to the Austen cooks. Lucy Worsley quotes in her book, Jane Austen at home, there were high hopes of each new cook and one of them made an auspicious beginning with a splendid apple pie. We try to include as much of the garden produce as we can in our cooking in the old kitchen tea room. On to the herb garden. Composition seems to me impossible with a head full of joints of mutton and doses of rhubarb. Letter from Jane Austen to Cassandra, 8th of September, 1816. Here, Jane Austen is referring to Jane West, author of Alicia de Lacey, an historical romance, and marvelling on Jane West's ability to be multitasking mother and author. What is also noteworthy is that Jane refers to doses of rhubarb, implying it's used medicinally rather than for eating. Yesterday I had the agreeable surprise of finding several scarlet strawberries quite ripe had you been at home, this would have been a pleasure lost. Jane Austen, letter, June 6th, 1811. Being later in the summer, Austen clearly had more luck with her strawberries than us. Leaving the walled garden, we moved to the shrubbery walk. There is nothing I would not do for those who are really my friends, Jane Austen, Northanger Abbey. This plaque was sponsored by a pair who became friends through Jane Austen. Now we enter the wilderness with a particularly apt quote. A considerable flight of steps landed them in the wilderness, which was dark and shade and natural beauty. 
they all felt the refreshment of it and for some time could only walk and admire Jane Austen, Mansfield Park. This is when the Bertrams are visiting Southerton Court and is a foreshadowing pivotal scene in the novel. Walking through the wilderness, we reach the Lime Avenue, the delicious shade of a broad, short avenue of limes. This comes as part of the description of Donwell Abbey. The quotation continues, It led to nothing, nothing but a view at the end over a low stone wall with high pillars, give the appearance of an approach to the house which had never been there. As you can see from our view of the limes, we have a splendid vantage of Chawton House. Before we continue on our path, we look back to the gamekeeper's hut. As the weather was fine, they had a pleasant walk of about half a mile across the park. This quote is taken from Pride and Prejudice when Mr. Collins shows Elizabeth and co around Rosings, his patron's home. From this vantage, we have a view of our own parklands, though we don't have as many windows as Rosings. On the edge of the wilderness is the South Lawn. It was one of the agreeable recollections of the ball, which she walked about the lawn the next morning to enjoy. This part of Emma is a moment of self-reflection for the titular heroine, who is now beginning to see the error of her ways and is starting to fall in love. We skirt the wilderness and reach the ha-ha. After sitting a little while, Miss Crawford was up again. I must move, she said. Resting fatigues me. I have looked across the ha-ha till I'm weary. I must go and look through that iron gate at the same view, without being able to see it so well. Jane Austen, Mansfield Park. Ha-ha serve as a neat literary image for unseen boundaries. Mary Crawford, much like Mariah Bertram before her, crosses the line from what is safe and acceptable to unsafe and non-acceptable territory. Following the line of the ha-ha, we gain a better parkland view, whence, in spots where the opening of the trees gave the eye power to wander, were many charming views of the valley, the opposite hills with the long range of woods overspreading many and occasionally part of the stream. Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice. Here is the moment when Elizabeth Bennet and the gardeners are on their visit to Derbyshire and Pemberley. They are getting a view of Pemberley as they do a circuit of the whole park and Elizabeth's opinion of Mr Darcy begins to change when his caring nature is reflected in the proper upkeep of his estate. At last, we finish at the walnut tree. The girl who could be gratified by a Robert Martin's riding about the country to get walnuts for her might very well be conquered by Mr Elton's admiration. Jane Austen, Emma. Mr Martin travelled a three-mile round trip to get Harriet Smith walnuts simply because she liked them. The snobbish Emma at the beginning of the novel is quick to dismiss Robert Martin's gesture as a boorish fancy, failing to see that love can be found in the smallest of gestures. The Jane Austen Garden Trail was a campaign coordinated by the North American Friends of Chawton House in order to raise funds for us. Donors sponsored one of 20 possible garden spots and chose a Jane Austen quotation to accompany it. Some chose their favourite Austen quotation, whilst others based their choice on what best fit the sign's location. Many of the sponsors are from various JASNA regions, Jane Austen Society of North America. We are hugely grateful for their support and are pleased that visitors will be able to enjoy this trail for many years to come. <laughs>